Chapter 2 Mitch rested in the cradle they had improvised for him, and from behind it appeared that he was sitting up. Given that there was nothing left of his body from the waist down, sitting wasn't exactly possible. He stopped in the middle, almost literally half a man, half an android, a ragged metaphone blob sealing his innards shut. He had done the repairs on his circulatory tubes himself, shunting, reconnecting, so that he was once again a closed system. That was how he'd put it, a closed system. The other half of him had been left on the alien's homeworld, torn off by a maddened drone protecting its nest. That alien was killed, and likely it and most of the others there were vaporized by the subsequent atomic explosions Wilkes had left them as a going-away gift. A man torn asunder as Mitch had been would have died on that hellish planet. From blood loss or maybe shock, androids were built better. He heard her come in. This was the starboard computer access compartment, smaller even than the place where she'd just left Wilkes. He heard her, but pretended he had not. Mitch? He shook his head. I can't get past the operating system, he said. Navigation access code is 65 digits, backed up by a second code of 40 numbers. It would take forever to get it, given the hardware I've got. And where are the other ships? We left Earth in the middle of an armada. They should be somewhere around here, but they aren't. We're alone. It doesn't make any sense. She moved to stand next to his cradle, resisted the impulse to stroke his hair. It's all right. No, it isn't all right. We don't know where we are, where we're going, if we'll even get there alive. I have to. It's my function to. He trailed off, shook his head again. Billy wanted to cry, something she'd done more of in the last week than ever in her life. His function. She'd fallen in love with an android. Worse, maybe, he'd fallen in love with her. He was having more trouble dealing with the feelings than she was. When they'd gone into the sleep chambers, she'd accepted it, believed it would be all right, somehow. But when they'd come out, something had changed. Some of it was him. Some of it, she had to admit, was her. She didn't think she was one of those people who carried her prejudices around like a club, bashing those who disagreed with her. She'd always paid lip service to equality. A person is a person, no matter if they're born of woman, incubated in an artificial womb, or made in the android vats. Where you came from wasn't important, only where you were going. Spend too much time looking back, you'd run into something and brain yourself, right? She had always said that. Androids were people. Yeah, but would you want your sister to marry one? Would you want to marry one yourself? Jesus. He hadn't told her. That was his main crime. She'd only found out after they had become lovers. After she had let him into her heart. That hurt. She hadn't thought she could ever get past that, but amazingly, she had. Or so she had thought. But now? It wasn't just that he was less than he had been. With the proper facilities, Mitch could be made whole again. As good as new. Meticulously designed muscles and perfect skin. All the right equipment in the right places. Stop it! No, there was something else going on here, and Billy didn't know exactly what. The man, artificial or not, she had fallen in love with, wasn't the same as he had been. Something inside his mind was different. She wanted to understand, wanted to give him all the slack he needed. But he had become someone else, a cold, fearful person who wouldn't let her in. Somebody who didn't want to hear about her love, or anger, or needs, hiding behind his wall, hands over his ears. Still, she kept trying. Mitch, listen, I... Now she did reach out and touch his hair. It felt as real as her own. Was real in that it had grown from his scalp the same way. Was made of a protein so similar, only a microscope could see the difference. Don't, Billy, he said. She felt the words like a blast of frigid air. So cold it took her breath away. How could he do this? 
not talk to her. Billy, please, try to understand. I, I'm not trying to hurt you. It's, it's just that I don't, I can't, I, I'm sorry. I'm tired, Billy said. I'm going to try to get some rest now. She walked away, nearly tripped as the faux gravity fluctuated a hair. They'd had problems with that. Nobody thought a robot ship really needed gravity in transit, and that system, like many of the others, had been rigged by Wilkes before they lifted. To hear him tell it, if somebody sneezed too hard, the ship would break up. The storeroom she used as her sleeping quarters was private, a three-meter by two-meter box, but since it was next to the ship's internal power and heating system, it was also hotter than most spots on board. She stripped to her undershirt and panties, lay down, and leaned back against the bulkhead that served as a pillow. Sweat slid down her bare skin, dampened her clothes, and made her feel sticky. Still, it wasn't unbearable, and it was damn sure better than the company she'd have to endure otherwise. She was dozing when Wilkes appeared in the doorway. She hadn't bothered to slide shut the hanging curtain she'd rigged. His sudden presence startled her. Oh, make some noise when you move, Wilkes. You scared me. He stepped into the room, his feet nearly touching hers. She sat up, drew her feet in. He'd seen her naked, but something about the way he stood there made her nervous. Everything scares you, Billy, he said. She blinked sweat away, wiped at her eyes. What are you talking about? He moved closer, knelt, reached out and caught her shoulders. When you were a kid, you were scared of dying. Later, you were scared of living. Jesus, Wilkes, back off. He slid his hands under her shirt before she could react, cupped her breast. And you've always been scared of me, he said. Her shock turned to anger. She grabbed his hands, pulled them from under her shirt. God damn it, what the hell do you think you're doing? He grabbed her wrists, leaned against her. His face was only centimeters from hers now. She could smell his sweat, his musk. You really prefer that thing in the computer room? Wouldn't you rather be with a real man? One who has all the right equipment? She felt something hard poke into her belly. Christ, was he going to rape her? Wilkes, stop it! Why are you doing this? He jerked back, his face gone slack for a beat, eyes closed. The lids snapped up, and an infernal light shined from his pupils at her. He grinned. Why? Because I'm going to make you face yourself. What you're afraid of. Love. Passion. Caring. People. Billy looked down, and saw that the bulge she'd felt wasn't what she'd thought. It was his belly. Ah! With this scream... His abdomen burst outward in a spray of flesh and gore, and a full-sized adult alien came forth. Impossible. It wasn't physically possible. It smiled at her, showing the sharp carnivore's teeth. Slime and blood dripped as it reached for her. Wilkes! Billy sat up, alone in her cubicle. Her shirt and panties were soaked with sweat. Her hair hung limp. Oh, fuck. A dream. Only a dream. But she knew better. It wasn't a dream. It was a vision. A communication. It was too real. It went too deep. They were here. On the ship. Billy grabbed her clothes and ran. Wilkes was fiddling with the program that ran external pickups hoping to figure a way to magnify images visually when Billy rushed in. She was half into her coverall, drenched in sour sweat. There wasn't much water on this tub. They probably had smelled a little overripe. Even Bueller, who had sweat glands that did a fair imitation of human ones. He was in the other seat, having hand-walked in earlier, dragging his little plastic cradle behind him, like some beggar from the streets of West L.A. Wilkes, they're here! On the ship! She grabbed at his shirt. Take it easy, take it easy, you saw one? She dreamed about it, Bueller said quietly. Billy turned and glared at him, as if he had violated some secret between them. 
It wasn't just a nightmare, Wilkes. I felt them. Remember the spacefarer alien who saved us? How I could feel his hatred? Yeah, the elephant man. Scavenger of doomed races. It was like that. I can still feel them. It's like some kind of light touch against my mind. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it is there. Wilkes shook his head. The kid was stretched too tight. They all were, cooped up on this bucket. They'd been through a lot. The stress had to come out somewhere. He'd been doing sets of push-ups and chin-ups and squats every day until he couldn't move anymore, trying to burn it out of himself. Look, Billy, it doesn't make any sense. Where's the gun, Wilkes? If you won't help me find them, I'll do it myself. Wilkes looked at Bueller. The android looked away. Dealing with emotional women was out of his territory. Wilkes knew that. Like it was something he knew how to do. Christ. Women were like another species sometimes. He didn't understand them at all. Well? All right. You want to play Marine? We'll play Marine. But I'll keep the gun. We've only got part of one magazine left. He stood, moved to the locker where he'd stored the carbine. He'd locked it securely away, along with the pistol he'd had before they went into the sleep chambers. He should have collected more ammo. Maybe another couple of M41Es before they lifted from Earth. A good Marine always armed himself as best he could when he could, but time had been a little tight. When your choice was hurrying to catch a ship leaving, or staying to face either an atomic fireball or a hungry monster, you didn't dick around looking for spare ammo. He did have a couple of grenades for the under-the-barrel launcher of the carbine, but those weren't much use on a vessel cruising through hard vacuum. Bust a hole in an external wall, and the cold emptiness outside would suck your air out and freeze it into nice little crystals for you. Only a madman wanted to make something go boom on a spaceship. Even the AP rounds from the 10 millimeter could be a problem. But at least the hole they might make would be real small. Toss a gum sparrow into the stream and it would plug the leak okay. He pulled the locker open, reached in, removed the carbine toggled the battery saver off and saw the LED light. Five rounds left in the magazine. Shit. Wait a second here, Wilkes. It's not as if we're gonna need even five rounds. The kid is just tense. We do a run-through and show her we're alone, and that's it. He turned to Billy. You wanna take the handgun? It won't do shit to the armor, but maybe if it opens its mouth... Give it to me, she said. Wilkes tendered the pistol, a slicked-up version of the standard army-issue Smith Auto. He'd taken it from the General back on Earth, after the bastard had shot Blake. The General had gotten off three rounds, then Wilkes had shot five more times. Eight. This model didn't have a counter. Fucking regular army was too cheap to install them. But it was a 15-round double-stack mag, so it had seven shots left. Eight if the general had kept an extra one in the chamber. Got seven rounds, he said. She checked the gun. I only need two, she said. Then she glanced over at Bueller. Three. Okay, let's go find the monsters, Wilkes said. Bueller, you want to tag along? Do you really think there is any danger? Wilkes looked at Billy, then back at Bueller. Truth? No. Then I'll stay here and continue to work on the computer. Wilkes could almost see Billy's anger smoldering. If he had said he thought there were aliens on the ship, then Bueller would have had to go along, being an android, to try to protect the two real humans. Let's move out, Billy. Her jaw muscles danced, and she nodded. Fine. What the hell, Wilkes thought. It was something to do. So far, it had turned up exactly what he'd thought it would. Zero. They'd been through all the ship, big enough to hide a small dog, and so far hadn't seen even an insect. Sometimes you got a few bugs on a ship, despite the zap fields supposed to keep them off. Some guys made pets out of them. That's it, Billy. End of sweep. Nobody home. What about the aft cargo storage? Wilkes leaned the carbine against the wall and scratched a sweaty itch on his shoulder. Can't get into it. Coded lock. We can't get in. Nothing can get out, either. 
Come on, Wilkes. I've seen these things operate. So have you. We could take a look at the door. That'll make you happy. It won't make me happy, but we have to check. He shrugged. He could cut her a little slack. She hadn't exactly had a great life. Both parents killed by the aliens, or worse, webbed into hatching chambers as baby alien food. Years in a mental hospital on Earth where they thought she was nuts because the mind wipe they'd tried broke down and let her remember it. And all the shit they'd been through since. What the hell? The corridor leading to the aft cargo hatch was narrow and dimly lit. But Wilkes could see down its length that the hatch door was shut and the LED on steady red lock. Like all inner doors, it was airtight and proof against sudden decompression or hammering of fists, if somebody got on the wrong side of it during an emergency. Standard duralloy plate, six or seven centimeters thick. Even the aliens could have trouble clawing through that. Knock, knock, Wilkes said. Anybody home? The pair of them stood in front of the hatch for a moment. Sorry, Billy. Looks like the hunt is over. What's that smell? She asked. Wilkes sniffed. Something burned. It smelled acrid, like cable insulation. A short somewhere? Could be easy, though, given how the ship was put together. It's stronger over here, she said pointing toward the side corridor they'd just passed. Better check it out. A lazy wisp of smoke crawled from the corridor, a heavy vaporous snake that stayed low, hugging the deck. Better grab an extinguisher, Wilkes said. Billy pulled one of the portables from the wall. Suddenly there came a loud metallic scream, the blare of a klaxon. Foam from a ceiling fire suppressor sprayed into the corridor ahead of them gushing from the cross corridor. Shit, Wilkes said. In his cradle, Bueller saw the fire alarm visual flash onto the screen in front of him. Shit. There wasn't a PA system on board. He couldn't call Billy and Wilkes. Using his hands, he flipped himself out of the cradle, hit the deck on his palms, and began to walk as fast as he could. It was awkward, but quick as a man might move if he were late for an appointment but didn't want to embarrass himself by running. The foam shut off and the klaxon followed it a second later. Wilkes sighed. That meant the fire was out. Or else the suppression system had given up the ghost. But he didn't feel any heat pour out of the corridor. Stay here. I'll check it out. Fuck that. I'll be right on your ass. He had to grin. Okay. Watch it. deck slippery. They were walking parallel to the aft cargo compartment, and it only took a couple of meters to find the source of the smoke. A dangling cable, burned through, still smoking a little even though covered with fire foam. Wilkes. He turned to see what Billy wanted. There was a hole in the wall between the corridor and the aft cargo hold. A ragged, melted gap big enough for a man to walk through without touching the edges. Melted by acid. Oh, shit, Wilkes said. Billy nodded. Yeah, 